It goes on to tell us here in chapter 17, it says she is the mother of harlots. Hmm. That means that this once pure virgin church has now become a corrupt church, and now she's a harlot, and she has brought forth daughters. Hmm. Daughters are like their mothers. Now, they may have different names, but they're like the mother. Isn't that right? Here's the key question I want you to ask yourself. Who are the daughters that this papal Roman church, now corrupted by Babylon, who are the daughters that she has brought forth? Think about it. May I say very kindly, and again, I'm not talking about people. We're talking about church systems. May I suggest that the daughters are all the churches that have come out of Catholicism? Let's take a couple examples and be very honest tonight. You see, folks, most churches in this city, if we're really honest, are nothing more than daughters of the Mother Church. Even Pope John Paul on his last trip to America has talked to all the churches, and he said, you are our separated children. We are the Mother Church. You are our separated children. Remember hearing him say that? Most of the churches in this city tonight, let's be honest, are nothing more than daughters of the Catholic Church. Sure, they may have different names, but they're exactly like the Mother Church. Let's take Baptist. Baptist folks are nothing more than a daughter of the Catholic Church, right? They teach the secret rapture, come straight from the Catholic Church. They teach that when you die, you have an immortal soul. The Baptist Church teaches that there's a hellfire that's going to burn for the ceaseless age of eternity. The Baptist Church teaches Sunday worship. The Baptist Church teaches the laws done away with. It's exactly like the Catholic Church. Isn't that honest? Maybe a couple teachings different. But that's just a daughter of the Catholic Church. Let's take the Lutherans. The Lutherans, folks, are exactly like the Catholic Church. So are the Pentecostals. So are the Methodists. Most churches in this city tonight are nothing but daughters of the Catholic Church. They have the same teachings, same false worship, same pagan beliefs, and same practices. And God brings us out in prophecy because he wants us to see that if we are in a church that even again has one teaching that comes from papal Rome or one teaching that's contrary to this Bible, let's get out of that church and let's follow the truth. Can you say amen? Now, this is why I'm going to bring you full circle now. I'm going to put it on the screen. When you go back to Revelation 12, what does the Bible tell us? Look at it very carefully. You can see it on the screen. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the woman. No way. The devil could care less about the woman. He knows he corrupted the woman. He could care less about that. You see, folks, the devil doesn't give a care about all these churches in this city tonight. He could care less. If you are going to the Baptist church, he loves it. He, is, he couldn't be happier because he knows he's got you. Amen? If you're going to a Pentecostal church, the devil just dances with joy when people pack the Pentecostal churches because he knows he's got them deceived. Amen? You're going to a Methodist church, an Episcopalian church, or an Alliance church, or a Lutheran church. The devil loves it when people go to those churches. He could care less. He's not the least bit worried about those churches at all. He's got them corrupted. He's got them in his hands. He's got them deceived. He loves for people to go to those churches. You know what he's mad about? Look at it carefully. The dead dragon was wroth, that means mad or angry, with the woman and went to make war. Not with the woman, but with the remnant of her seed. Who? Which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the object of Satan's deepest hellish passion. The devil could care less about the woman. What he's mad about is that in the last days, there is still a remnant of the original woman's seed. There's still a commandment keeping people on this earth, and the devil hates 
that church. He has great wrath against that church because there's a church that keeps the commandments of God and still has the faith of Jesus. There's still a group of people on this earth. There's still a visible body of believers that's following the Bible and the Bible only. And the devil hates that church. You might as well know something, folks. If you're going to be part of this remnant church, all hell will bust loose. But you're on the winning team. Can you say amen? If you want to just be lazy and be mediocre and just be a nominal Christian, you know, go to church once a week and play church. Man, there's a hundred churches that will accommodate you. But I'm going to tell you what. When you become part of this remnant church, you are part of a prophetic movement. You are part of something that the devil hates. You are part of an original remnant seed. You're part of a commandment-keeping people. And you're part of a people that are proud to say, I follow the Bible and the Bible only. Can you say amen? That's what the devil's mad at. Could care less about all these other churches. He just hates that little remnant that's still left on earth. But I'll tell you what, I love the little remnant tonight. Can you say amen? And we're here tonight to give the devil a good kick in the seat of the pants and tell him to go to hell because God's remnant and God's truth shall prevail. Come on and say amen. Proud to be part of God's remnant tonight. And I don't care how mad the devil gets, the madder he gets, the happier I get. Let all hell break loose. We are here tonight to expose the works of the devil and to uplift the glory of Jesus Christ because he's always had a remnant and he's always going to have a remnant and his remnant shall prevail because God's truth shall prevail. Can you say amen? Oh, I'm proud to be part of this remnant church. It's exciting and folks, it's a tremendous blessing. Let me give you a little history here to show how this works. Real quickly on the screen, I want to give you a little bit of your history. You know, God has always worked with his people through the ages. He's always had faithful people that follow his truth. We've studied night by night how the system works, where papal Rome ruled for 1,260 years, and we learned how the pure woman fled into the wilderness here. The truth is cast down step by step. We enter the dark ages. We finally get to the year 1229. That's known as the darkest hour on earth's history. That's when the Bible was forbidden by the papal church. I don't know if you're aware of that. If you were caught with one scripture in your hand, you were burned alive at the stake. Earth was dark, no Bibles. Everybody was illiterate. It was just a very, very dark time, particularly over in Western Europe and so on. But God slowly began to bring all of it back step by step, as he promised he would. Even through these dark times, God still had a remnant people. Sometimes in the strongholds in the mountains over there in Western Europe, in Africa, in other places, God has always had his faithful people. But you read the story in history, it's exciting. There was a man in the 1300s by the name of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe got hold of a Bible, and you know what he did? He translated it into the common language of the people, the English language. And this was the first step in bringing back God's truth, which had been cast down for so many years. Now, it wasn't until after this man died in the year 1384 that the real bloodbath of martyrdom began during the Dark Ages. Papal Rome realized what this guy had done, John Wycliffe, in translating the Bible into the common language of the people. They got so mad. You know what they did? The Pope that was, this is a true story. The Pope that was on the throne got so mad, he issued an edict, sent his army to this man's grave 44 years after he died. And they dug up this man's bones and remains and brought him into the city center and burned his remains publicly to show their hatred and contempt for this man that had brought the Bible back to the language of the people. But folks, God had started something. Can you say amen? This is really exciting. And so the next man on the scene was a man by the name of John Huss. You may have studied him in world history. Tremendous man of God. He got hold of one of these Bibles and he read it and he says, man, this is the truth. This Bible is the word of God. Now, it's not the it's edict of priests and it's, it's not what the Pope says and so on. And folks, you take that for granted today. But I'll tell you what, that very thought shook Europe to its foundation. It took them a hundred years to understand that this is the Bible, the word of God. This is the authority. Today we have an freedom. We take it for granted, but they didn't even know it back then. And this man began to preach it boldly. This is the Bible. This is the word of God. This is what you need to follow. Don't worry about man or traditions of man or commandments of man. Keep the word of God. Follow the Bible. And folks, it cost this man his life. In the year 1415, he was arrayed before a papal tribunal. And there they judged him and excommunicated him and, and said, you're worthy of death. They gave his soul to the devil. And folks, they marched him out to the city center where they had a big stake in the ground. They stripped the man nude, tied him to the stake with chains, put wood and straw all around him and lit the fire and they burned that man alive for declaring the Bible is the word of God. I'll tell you folks, when I study the faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeons and fire and sword, I'll tell you folks, we got so much to be thankful for today. Can you say amen? 
We don't even know what the smallest sacrifice is. You know, I accidentally clicked this button. Can you guys upstairs go that one slide back? I accidentally clicked this. It's not where I want to go. Thank you so much. You guys are right on. And I, I tell you, folks, I come to the United States of America, and I see here in America what passes for Christianity. We got this sickening, sickening, saccharine, sentimental slop religion where we cannot even make the smallest sacrifice for Jesus Christ. I hear people all the time say, you mean I got to give up my little trinkets? Well, what are my friends going to say if I follow the Bible? Or it's going to be hard to change, Leo. God, I tell you, folks, is going to look at you and I someday and say, you're going to tell me that you could not follow my truth because you were afraid of what your friends were going to say? God's going to look in our face and say, you were too afraid to stake your stand for the truth and to go all the way to follow my Bible because you were afraid of what people would say? You couldn't give up this little sin? You couldn't give up this little trinket? God's going to say, listen, look at the blood stained pages of history. There are millions and millions and millions of men and women and boys and girls that went to the stake and burned alive and gave their lives and shed their blood and they were glad to do it. Amen. Don't talk to me about how hard it is to be a Christian. you got freedom. you got the Bible. If you can't stand up for Jesus, go home. Amen. And I'll tell you, folks, I would rather get five people in this meeting that are fully consecrated to go all the way with Jesus than 500 half-baked Christians. The church is full of them already. Amen. And if you're too afraid to stand up for Jesus, I'm here to tell you, you have millions, millions of brothers and sisters who died and gladly burned alive for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to hear another puny excuse from any one of you why you can't do what God says and why you can't keep the commandments and how hard it is. Get a life. Amen? And again, folks, we're serious here tonight. You either go all the way with God or quit making a profession. Amen. Either say, Lord, I will love you and obey you, or don't even try to go to church anymore. Either get in or get out. Amen? And I say that in love tonight. But folks, we are in the final seconds of this earth's history. And God is calling out a people who are not afraid of what others think. He's calling out a people who are not afraid to stand for the truth. He's calling out a people who are proud to be Christians. Amen. I want to be one. Amen? All right. The next man on the scene was Martin Luther, great man of God. He studied the Bible and discovered in the Bible the beautiful teaching of justification by faith. Began to teach and step by step God was bringing the truth. Calvin came next, brought in salvation by grace. Wesley came in, brought in the new birth and obedience to God's law. Williams came in, baptism by immersion. And folks, step by step by step by step, God began to bring the truth back. But then one of the saddest things happened. People began to put their eyes on these men like Luther and Calvin and Wesley rather than on the truth that these men were bringing out. And we got stuck with what we know today as denominationalism. In other words, John Huss had some truth, yes. He made the first baby steps. But Luther had more truth than Huss did, but the Hussites wouldn't go any farther. This is where we get the brethren churches today. Yeah, they got a little bit of truth, but a whole lot of papal, papal Rome and false teaching. The Lutherans had the same problem, though. Calvin had a lot more light than Luther did, but the Lutherans wouldn't go on. Martin Luther begged them, don't call yourselves Lutherans, call yourselves Christians. You ought to read his testimonies about it. But they wouldn't do it. And so they have some truth, yes, but they still have a lot of error and false teachings of Rome. Calvinists had the same problem, because Wesley had more truth. But they got stuck with Calvin. This is where the Presbyterian church has come from. The Wesleyans had the same problem. Wesley had truth, but Williams had more truth. But they wouldn't go on. This is where we get the Methodist churches. In other words, folks, all churches today have some truth, of course. But most hold on to many errors and pagan teachings and false worship that's contrary to the Bible. But I'm thankful God says there's still a remnant. Amen? Let's go to 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul warns us about this. And Paul begs us not to follow man and folks, this is why from the very beginning of this seminar, I have begged you, don't follow me. Don't follow a church. Follow Jesus and follow the truth. Can you say amen? It's always a tendency to want to follow man. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, they had this problem and they've always had this problem. Let's make sure we don't fall into it. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4. The Bible says, For while one saith, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, 
Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. In other words, let's not follow man. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? That's what's most important. All right. In spite of these sad developments that took place, the Bible has told us that truth would continue to grow. And God has told us in the book of Revelation, there will be a remnant church. There will be a commandment-keeping people. There will be a people that are following the faith of Jesus Christ, the Bible, and the Bible alone in the last days. And my friends, I believe with all my heart that God's remnant church exists tonight on this earth. I believe around the entire world there's groups of men and women. I believe there's a body of believers worldwide that's united by the truth of this book right here in the faith of Jesus Christ. I believe all over this world tonight there is a commandment keeping people. Can you say amen? How did it come together? Let me share with you some of the most incredible things in Bible prophecy. As God began to restore the truth step by step, we finally come here to the late 1700s, early 1800s, just about right there. God has the stage set. Because in the late 1700s, something incredible happens. The power of papal Rome is broken. Now, we take that for granted again today because we have such religious freedom. But folks, until the early 1800s, no one had religious freedom. No one was allowed to own a Bible. Earth was dark. It was a mess down here. And so God let papal Rome finally come to its end in the French Revolution, and it brought in religious freedom for the first time. Thank God for that every day. Can you say amen? Then, something else God did was incredible. In the year 1800, 6% of European and American society could read or write. Only 6%. We were basically illiterate. However, from 1800 to the year 1860, as you know, education began to be emphasized in Europe and in America, and the learning curve went straight up. By, 19, excuse me, by 1860, 86% of Americans could read and write. Now that caused a revolution because knowledge now was coming back. Then God had the stage set in one other thing. The invention of the most incredible thing, in fact, voted number one in this last millennium, and that was the invention of the printing press. You heard that on the news, didn't you? God had the stage set. And they figured out how to make a mechanized press where they could crank out Bibles by the hundreds of millions in a few hours. And when the printing press was developed in the mid-1800s and perfected, the American Bible Society was born, the British Bible Society was born. And within the period of about eight to ten years, every American and European and person in the world that wanted a Bible was basically able to get a Bible in their own language. Now that had never happened in world history. Now try to get the picture here. Religious freedom, learning curve goes straight up. Everybody now learns, basically knows how to read and write. Bibles are available for the first time to anybody that wants one. I'll tell you folks, it caused a religious awakening that was unprecedented from any other time in this earth's history. And as God's people from all denominations like you see here began to have these Bibles and look at them and so on, they began to look at each other and say, listen, we've got one Bible, there's one Jesus Christ. Why don't we all believe the same thing? Why do we have this church and that church and this denomination and that denomination? Why don't we all just follow the same Bible and the same Jesus? And my friends, in a spirit of love and in a desire to follow God and His truth, men and women from every denomination and walk of life began to come together and say, let's put aside our doctrinal differences. Let's see what the Bible says. So let's say you get a Baptist here and a Methodist here. And they would say, let's study the subject of Bible baptism. That's a very important teaching of Jesus. And as they did, the Methodists would say, well, I think it's by sprinkling. The Baptists would say, no, I believe the Bible teaches it's by immersion. All right, let's not fight about it. Let's not let our denominational barriers come between. Let's go to the Bible. And they read every text in the Bible, all 28 on baptism. You know what? The Methodists said, Baptist, you're right. The Bible teaches baptism by immersion. I want to follow the Bible. And my friends, in this spirit of love, and in an attitude of God's people coming together and saying we want to know the truth of the Bible, God's people began to unite step by step by step. Truths that had been hidden under years of darkness began to come out. The law of God, the seventh day Sabbath, the three angels' meshes that had to be carried to the whole world. And my friends, from these humble beginnings, men and women from all different denominations coming together, God's remnant church began to form. Can you say amen? It's always existed, because God's always had his people.
But this remnant body in Revelation that God prophesied would take his gospel to the world, united by the truth, it began to come together as men and women simply said, let's follow the Bible and let's follow Jesus Christ. And I'm happy to tell you tonight, folks, that that body of believers tonight now surrounds the entire globe and the sun never sets on God's remnant church. Can you say amen? It's a beautiful thing and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. In fact, think about it here. The same thing has happened and continued right here in this meeting, night by night. We met together over a month ago. All different denominations, about 30 different denominations, came into this building. And from the opening night, I said, we have one criteria in this meeting, the Bible and the Bible alone. Can you say amen? And I said, let's put aside our denominational barriers and let's study all of Jesus' teachings. Let's study the prophecies and let's let the Bible bring us together. And you know, folks, as we sit here tonight and look at each other's faces, God's Word has brought us together. And I can say by the grace of God and to God's glory, we are following tonight, each of us, one Christ. We're all looking in His beautiful face. We're following one Bible and one Bible alone. We're following one law and one set of commandments. And when the truth of Jesus, His Word and His law, brings people together, you know what? We all end up believing the same thing because there's only one truth. There's only one faith. There's only one body. And tonight, God wants us to become part of that body. That as you become part of it, you strengthen it. You may say, I'm just an insignificant part. I'm not really important. Folks, everybody's important. And as you become part of the body, and this person becomes part of the body, and this person takes their stand for the truth, and this person says, I want to be part of that commandment keeping people, folks, it'll grow and grow. And I'm happy to tell you tonight, it's the fastest growing body of believers in the entire world. And wherever you go around the world, you will find God's remnant people. Oh, what a pleasure and what a privilege to be part of this remnant in the last days. And as we close tonight, many of you have already said, Leo, I want to follow the truth of Jesus. I've learned so much here. I want to become part of a people that keep the commandments of God. I want to follow the truth that I've learned. And tonight as we close, I want to give you the opportunity to literally make the happiest, the most wonderful, the most pleasurable decision that you're ever going to make in your life. And that is to take all you've learned this last month and tonight, take your stand for Jesus and say, Lord, I'm going to follow the truth. I'm going to become part of your remnant church. Many of you already expressed the desire to do that. Tonight, as God's Spirit speaks to your heart after this month we've spent together, I want to invite you to take that stand tonight for Christ to help you to do that. It's a very happy decision. I've asked the gentleman to pass out one more card. And these cards are just a way that's very personal between you and God that you can say, yes, Lord. We can go ahead and do it right now, gentlemen. Go ahead and pass them out. It's just a way for you to be able to say, Lord, here on paper, I've made my decision step by step. I've heard your spirit speak to my heart, and I choose to follow Jesus Christ. As Tammy comes up and plays softly tonight, I want to encourage you that this is one of the most important, one of the happiest, one of the most incredible decisions you'll ever be able to make for Jesus Christ. Just take a card and pass one right down to the person beside you. There's pencils in front of all of you. And tonight as we close, let's walk through this together. Let's invite Jesus right here with us right now and ask his presence to be in our hearts. Let's ask him to guide our thoughts. And I want to invite each person to take a card right now. Just look at it carefully. Just go ahead and pass one to the first person there, the next person beside you. Let's walk through it together. The first box says, I choose to take the Bible only as my guide to the truth. I pray tonight that every one of you will be able to check that box and say, yes, Lord, the Bible and the Bible only will be my guide to truth. The second and the third box go together. Let's walk through this carefully together, kindly with Jesus. The next box says, I realize how error and traditions have been kept in many Christian churches. The third box, I choose to come out of Babylon and all false worship and into the one faith of Jesus. I believe there comes a point in each of our experience where we need to confess to Jesus, Lord, I have been sincere. I have been fellowshipping in a body of believers that I thought was good. And folks, it was. You learned a lot of things. God has used it as a stepping stone. But there comes a point of confession where you say, Lord, I realize now that I've not been following all the truth. I realize the church I'm attending is not teaching everything. There's some things that are contrary to your word. And to confess, say, Lord, I'm sorry, but now I choose to come out of Babylon and into the one faith of Jesus. That is the decision that pleases the Lord. Do it because you love Christ. The fourth box says, I'd like to become part of God's remnant church. 
That's the happiest decision. It's the most powerful decision you'll ever make in your life. God needs you to take that stand. God needs you to be willing to stand for his truth. God invites you tonight not to stay in Babylon, because if you stay in Babylon and other churches, then my friend, you're actually fellowshipping in darkness. You're working against Jesus. He says, I want you to be part of a body of believers that follows the faith of Jesus, that keeps the commandments of God. Help champion my truth to the world. God needs you. He's counting on you. This church is not perfect. The reason is I'm part of it. And we're all growing in God's grace. But God needs a willing heart. And if your heart is willing, you may be weak, you may be feeble, you may be strong. But wherever you are, God can use you in a powerful way. I encourage you to take your stand. Say, yes, Lord, I want to be part of it. If you'd like to follow Jesus in baptism, many of you have made that decision. You can recommit it tonight. If you'd like a personal visit, feel free to check that as well or be sure to stop by and sign in on the registration sheets we can visit together this week. And if you'd be so kind as to just print your name there, I would really appreciate you printing your name. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward. But before I do, I want to go to this Bible verse. I want to invite each one of you to look into Jesus' face because he's here right now with you. If Jesus tonight gave you the invitation to become part of his remnant church, to follow his truth, to become part of a commandment-keeping people, if Jesus were standing right here tonight, what would you say to Jesus? That's the only question that matters. Look in his beautiful face. And the Bible verse says, they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I claim that verse in your behalf tonight. It tells me I don't have to ask people to make this decision. It tells me God will speak to your heart. And so if God is speaking to your heart right now, I encourage you to step forward and say, thank you, Jesus, for the truth. Thank you for leading me. And I happily make this commitment to you tonight. As Tammy plays quietly, I want to invite you quietly and reverently to just come and lay that card right here on the altar and say all to Jesus, I surrender. And make that decision for Christ tonight. And let's pray for each other and let's make this decision with joy and happiness. And may God bless you as you come forward and seal it with him tonight. God bless you. Let's pray for each other in this moment. Many of you have always been part of God's remnant. You've served God faithfully and to the best of your knowledge. And His Spirit has just taken you one step farther in the last few weeks that we've been studying together. And when God speaks to our hearts and leads us to truth, then He puts within us a desire to follow that truth and to bring glory to Him. Sometimes it's hard to get out of the pew. Sometimes the old devil tries to hold us back because of our friends or our family members or just because we sometimes feel like we're not good enough, whatever it may be. I want to encourage you tonight. Look full in Jesus' face. And if you hear his voice speaking to you, step forward in faith and say, yes, Lord. Don't be afraid of what others will think or what people will say or whatever may happen. The devil puts those thoughts in your mind. I just want to encourage you, take a step for Jesus. He stood for you one day. He's coming soon. God needs you, not just to stay where you are, because when you stay where you are, you've made a decision against Jesus. When you don't make a decision, you've made a decision to be on Antichrist's side. So I want to really encourage you tonight. By making a decision, you show your love for God. 
And even though something may be holding you back, listen to that still small voice of Christ and his Holy Spirit and say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. As Tammy plays this last verse, I want to urge you to come forward. This opportunity may never come again. And while you hear the voice of Jesus, be bold and say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Let's pray for each other. And please slip out just as you hear this last verse. And let's go all the way with Christ.